Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right, I'm gonna go out on a limb and I'm gonna do something different this morning because I'm kind of a visitor and uh, I don't know who the deacons are. So if I don't know, and I'm the guy preaching, maybe somebody else doesn't know. So deacons, would you raise your hand in case anyone is interested in membership so that they can know who to go to? Where are my deacons? I've got one up here. I've got deacons in the back. Come on, guys, set the example. Move forward. Come forward. Let's play a song of Just As I Am. We'll sing it till you move forward. Don't make me start singing, because then you'll have to move to the back. All right, oh, those are the things that get me in trouble. All right, <clears throat> so the other thing is uh, you should be turning to 1 Kings 18. The other thing is we've been singing this song, Amen, and you sang a, we all sang a key phrase, uh, the first stanza, and it says, Lord, we're crying out for faith to believe the words you say. And I thought that was really fitting this morning as we sing that, as we look at the life of Elijah and Obadiah and the quiet boldness. Hopefully that made you stop and think, go, how can you have quiet boldness? Well, this morning, we're going to be able to look at that and learn about the quiet boldness. So as you turn, let's just settle our hearts this morning and talk to the Lord before we get into his word. Lord, we're so glad that we are part of the family that you have taken us from an orphanage, from a life of sin and being lost, and that you sent Jesus because of your great love for us. And Lord, you loved us first, and you gave us the greatest gift. And Lord, our response is joy, it's gratitude, and we're here to glorify you and here to grow in our knowledge of you, and then to take that knowledge and apply it to our lives. So, Lord, may you take the next few moments and set aside the stress of the week to past, the anxiety of the week to come, and just help us to settle on your word that we might be challenged by your word as we continue to live lives in obedience to you. It's in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. All right, so uh, how many of you are into reality TV? Anybody into, like, reality TV? It would be like American Idol. Anybody like American Idol? 1-866-436-5702 or text word vote 5702. Standard text rates to apply. I almost got it, but Ryan Seacrest beat me out. I don't know why. Anyway, uh, I've been watching TV. Sometimes I can't sleep at night. Sometimes I get bored at my job, so I start to scroll. And I found this new reality TV show. It's called Undercover Boss. Has anybody ever seen this? I mean, I'm sitting here going, this is, this is really funny. I'm watching reality TV. It's not new. It's new to me, so that makes it new. Uh, <laughs> So I found this new old show. There's nothing new under the sun. It just recycles. Bell bottoms are coming back. Anyway, <clears throat> so the premise of this show is you get this huge, big company, you know, big like um, Goodyear or Starbucks or some big mega corporation, and their CEO comes, and he or she, they change their appearance, and they go and they work at the organization to be able to learn about the company, and they usually lie to their employees. This is not a good strategy, but you lie to those employees saying that this person's on a reality TV show, and then they follow them around, and these employees have no idea. And I'm sitting here going, how can you not have any idea that you're going to be on, and they're going to flip the script on you? But anyway, I just sit here, and I'm, I'm absorbed by it, by the 47 minutes and 48 seconds of this TV show. And... Uh, I just sit there and I watch this boss interact with the employees. And then if you've seen the show, they turn it and they bring the employee in saying, hey, what do you think about this guy or gal? And I'm like, well, we really don't think he's ever going to make it. Or she's not going to make it in the company. And then he goes or she goes, do you know who I am? No, I have no idea. I'm the owner. You can just see the, the, the color just wash from their face. And then during this time, the employee shares life with his boss. I'm like, why are you sharing about your intimate details, your life on national television? I just don't understand. And then the employee gets this gift from this boss. And at this point, I'm just sitting here weeping, going, oh, I never saw this coming. Pray for me, please. And I just sat there thinking, this, cover, this undercover boss. Well, today in the life of Obadiah, we're going to meet an undercover secret agent in the life of Obadiah. So hopefully by now, you are in 1 Kings chapter 18. All right, here we go. Here's what God's word says. After a long time, 
Well, again, where are we at? Well, we're in Zarephath. I'm going to bring a map up in about two slides. But Elijah's in Zarephath. He's with the widow. If you remember last week, we looked at the life of the widow, and she lost her son. And she cried out to Elijah, and Elijah went up, and he laid on the boy three times, brought the boy back to life. And the widow said, now I know. I just don't have this academic knowledge. I'm all in. And so Elijah is there, and he's comfortable in Zarephath. He, he either doesn't know or is not threatened by Jezebel and Ahab. And not all of a sudden, after a long time, well, James 5 tells us that the drought was three and a half years. So somewhere in the third year of the drought, three years without drought. So give or take, this is COVID. When COVID started or when it was at the height of it is when time started till now, give or take a couple months. That time that has not rained. And so God has said, Elijah, I need you to go. So the word of the Lord came to Elijah. If you're an underliner, I want you to underline this. The word of the Lord came to Elijah. I need you to go and present yourself to Ahab. I want you to leave the comfort of Zarephath. I want you to leave the comfort of your home. I want you to leave this widow and her son. I want you to leave the ministry of Zarephath. And I want you to come south and I want you to take on the king. I want you to go meet the king. Now again, I don't ever want to say scripture is missing something, but I wonder if there was a conversation between Elijah and God saying, God, are you sure? God, do you really want me to go? Because Elijah is comfortable. And Elijah is in a place where he has a ministry. He's safe. And yet God has told him to go. Go show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. Now remember, if you want to go back your homework this afternoon, go back to 1 Kings chapter 17. And Elijah said to the king in his throne room, Hey, it's not going to rain until I say, and the Lord has said, Elijah, it's time. It's time for rain to come. So Elijah went and presented himself to Ahab. Look at the obedience. Underline, circle, highlight, star the obedience of Elijah. When God says go, Elijah went. And he didn't find excuses. He didn't find a different way to go. He picked up his stuff and he began to walk. Now the land in Samaria was experiencing a great famine. Let's get our map going. So the blue arrow on the right is the Chidrith Valley or the ravine where he was at for probably the first six to nine months. He moved up to the top red arrow, which is Zarephath, which give or take is probably about two to a half years. Now I'm not willing to uh, to die for any of these times, I'll let you buy me a cup of coffee and I'll explain why. But basically about two and a half years, he lived up in Zarephath. Uh, pop quiz, what's so important or interesting about Zarephath? Who came out and landed Zarephath? Her, Jezebel, very good. So he's hiding from the very woman and he's hiding from her in her homeland. And he's there and he's comfortable. God's kept him safe. God says it's time to go. So he's going back to Samaria. That bottom arrow on the left side, he's going to trek through that area. Now remember what's going on during this time. Well, Jezebel and Ahab have one mission, to wipe out all of the prophets of God and elevate the prophets of Baal. Because Ahab and Jezebel want a false worship. We call that idolatry. And they want that to be the nation's worship. And God says, I want to take you out of the comfort of Zarephath, where you're safe, and I want to put you right into the mouth, into the heat or the furnace. And I'm just sitting there going, boy, I wonder if Elijah ever went, are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? And so just, a, just an extra question that's not on the slides. It's just, is God calling you out of your comfort zone into something that's going to be a little bit of heat? Is he calling you into stretching you into a place you go, I'd really rather not be stretched there. I'd rather be comfortable. I don't want to go exercise. I'd rather just sit in my comfy recliner with my heated blanket to the glory of Jesus. And friends, I just wonder this morning if some of you are being stretched. So we see here in verse 3 that Ahab had summoned Obadiah. Now, Obadiah is my undercover boss. And I think, this is my opinion, 
that this passage is more about Obadiah, and I'm going to pull more out from the life of Obadiah than I will Elijah. So Obadiah had been summoned. He was the palace administrator. Now, there's not a really good correlation between palace administrator and our government, so I'm going to struggle to find a good example. Uh, Some commentators said he's like the vice president. He's really Ahab's right-hand man. Some would say he's the uh, chief of staff. Everything that Ahab and Jezebel do, they run through Obadiah. He's the guy that organizes. He's the guy that knows. If you really want to know what's going on, you don't ask the president or the vice president. You ask the chief of staff. If you ever watch these shows like The West Wing or you get these presidential movies, it's always the chief of staff that knows what's going on, okay? That's not meant to be a political statement. That's just meant to be an observation. So don't misapply that until we get over it to eat the desserts. Then we'll talk, okay? So look at what it says. Obadiah, he's high up in the administration. There's the king and the queen, or there's the queen and the king, depends on how you want to look at it. And then the third in command is Obadiah. You could even say it's the speaker of the house in our government. Okay, that, have you understand how high up this guy is? Now look what it says. Obadiah was a devout believer in the Lord. Hold on. What's going on in Israel? Well, there's false worship being pushed from the I'm going to say from the government, from the king, there is this false worship, this idolatry that is being pushed by the king. And yet the third in command is a devout believer in God. And may we never lose hope that even though it looks bad from the top, God is working behind the scenes. God is on the move, and Obadiah is going to be that focus for us this morning. So, Obadiah, just think about this. There is a lot of pressure. And I've all, some other time, I could tell you about my fascination with the White House and the government and Air Force One and all of that. I just, I can't imagine the pressure and the stress that Obadiah is under. As he works for a man, quote, works for a man that has a pagan mindset. And yet Obadiah is able to keep his faith. If you want a homework this afternoon, sounds like another guy we know of, Daniel. Daniel in the lion's den. He stood up and out of all the false worship, he says, no, I will not bow. And he was the one that was excommunicated. So the question I have for you this morning, and I want to be careful how I apply it, but I just want to put it out there for you, is am I bending to the ungodly culture? There is a push for us to bend. There is a push for us to break. There is a push for us to compromise. And yet this morning we see from Obadiah, this man who's working for a pagan guy, and yet he's able to keep his faith in God. A great example for us, (coughs) sorry, for us to look at Obadiah going, how can you be in the world, but not be of the world? And so this morning I just want to, Put that out there for you and ask you. We're living in a post-Christian society. We're living with a lot of godless influence in our life. That would be a great place for you all to say amen. I mean, I can go down the rabbit trail if you want. But are we not being infiltrated and pressured to change and conform and to stand against God? And yet here we see Obadiah, the diamond in the rough of this guy standing up and saying, no. I will not bend my standards to, the for, to conform to culture. And so I just wonder for you this morning, are you bending? Are you breaking? Are you being corrupted by this world? Because we're called to be in this world, but not of this world. So we know that about Obadiah. So while Jezebel was killing off the Lord's prophets, remember she put out this APB or this warrant for the arrest of the prophets of God. Obadiah had taken a step of faith, and he had taken 100 prophets. So that, put that in there. I'm going to come back to that for the next two weeks. All right, there's 100 prophets that are what? They're being hidden in two caves, 50 each. Why did he hide 50 in each cave? In case she finds one, there's another 50 prophets. So there is this revival that's happening behind the scenes. So step back and look at it from a 30,000 foot, 30, foot view. 
There's godless leadership pushing an idolatry on the people of God. And yet the third in command is working behind the scenes to stash God's prophets. Now think about this. Step back. It took me three readings of this to get what Obadiah was doing. Obadiah is the office administrator. He's the chief of staff. He knows the king's move before the king knows the king's move, perhaps. And if he doesn't know it before the king, who's the first person the king's going to tell? Obadiah. So Obadiah, who's a believer in God, wants revival to come. If he knows anything, he knows exactly where to hide these prophets. Because as Jezebel and Ahab are going through, who do you think they're telling where they're looking next for the prophets? They're telling Obadiah. So Obadiah says, oh, hey, the cave near Athens has just been searched. They're not coming back to that for three months. Guess what? Bloop, 50 prophets right there where they just searched. And I can almost see them having this chess game and Obadiah going, yeah, there's someone behind him knowing the next move. And so you can see Obadiah, he's not bending to culture, even though he's got a godless boss. So he hid these prophets in two caves. Each of them he had supplied with food and water. What's significant about that? There's a drought. How long has the drought been going? Two and a half to three, probably three years by now. How hard is that to be stashing food and water when there's no food and water? It's almost like when you have a child and they're going to bed and you see a big old glass of water and they've got it kind of hidden here. What are you doing? Uh, nothing. You ever have a child, I'm just saying, I read it on Google, have a, like there's a glow about them and it's in their pocket and you're like, what's that glowing in your pocket? Jesus, because he's the light of the world. I thought, oh, I might be your cell phone trying to sneak that to bed. Here comes Obadiah and he's sneaking around these prophets and he's able to stash food and water when there's so little food and water. And I I don't want to pull it out and put into the text, but I just wonder if God miraculously provided food and water for Obadiah to get to those prophets. I can't prove it is or it isn't. I'm just saying, look at how God is working. So be encouraged. In a godless leadership, in a godless culture with idolatry being pushed, here comes God providing a remnant of prophets for a revival to come. You know who Obadiah reminds me of? I was sitting there, and I was, I was like, who does Obadiah remind me of? Obadiah reminds me of a modern missionary in a closed country. And I don't know, and I know this goes out on the internet, but I don't know if you support any missionaries that are in a closed country. But that's what Obadiah is. Obadiah is going out, and he's putting his life on the line. I'm not looking for glorification of Obadiah. But Obadiah is going out into a foreign land, working under a godless government, preaching and teaching and helping God's people. But notice what he's doing. He's doing it quietly. He's not out there going, hey, King Ahab, I'm going to go put 50 prophets in the cave just because I'm against you. Obadiah was a really smart man, but he had a boldness about him, but he had a quiet boldness. And that's why I'm calling this passage the quiet boldness of Obadiah. So the second question I have for you this morning is, how can I encourage someone who's serving? Yet again, we see this theme of encouraging and someone who's serving. Obadiah is willing to help move the prophets. Now, I have, I have been blessed. I have not been persecuted. No one has asked for my head or my life for the stance I have taken, but maybe you know someone that could use encouragement during a really difficult time. Maybe food or water, literally food or water, could be a blessing. And here comes Obadiah looking at these 50 prophets. I don't know if Obadiah went out. I don't know if he sent someone else out. There's a lot of questions I have about to God. When I get to heaven, it probably won't matter, but it makes me think now. And here comes Obadiah going, hey, 50 guys, come on. Follow me, trust me. Here's some more water. Oh, thanks so much. Hey, trust me, Jezebel, she's not coming back for three months. You're good. All right, two weeks, we got to move. Just relax. I've got you. I'm encouraging you. You keep praying. You keep working as I keep you hidden. 
And I just wonder this morning, friends, who can you encourage? Someone that's serving. Do you have that person in mind? What could you do? What could you do to encourage them? So Ahab said to Obadiah, he goes, hey, Obadiah, we need to uh, figure out what's going on here in the land. <coughs> Sorry. So Ahab said to Obadiah, go through the land, all the springs and the valleys. Maybe we can find some grass to keep the horses and mules alive. What's going on in the house of Ahab? The drought has finally hit home. Pain causes change. So Ahab says to Obadiah, rough translation from the book of Tom, hey bud, listen, my animals are starting to suffer. We need to find food and water. Look who he turns to. He turns to Obadiah. I need you to go one way and I'll go the other. Your job is to find food and water. That's what we need so that we will not have to kill any of our animals. And yet again, you can see the selfishness of Ahab. Leadership. Leadership should be about serving. Leadership should be about how can I serve you? How can I help you? A natural reading of the text, I don't want to pull too hard, but Ahab's like, give me, give me, give me, when Ahab should be, how can I serve you? So he says to Obadiah, you head north, I'll head south, and we're just going to figure out, and we're going to be able to find some water. So they divided the land where to cover, Ahab going in one direction and Obadiah going in another. I'm assuming, and I don't ever want to assume in the scripture, but I would, I would surmise, that sounds better, I would surmise that Obadiah went north, because why? Zarephath north, and he's going to run into Elijah. So they went and covered a direction, one in each way. As Obadiah was walking, Elijah met him. Obadiah recognized him. I don't know how he recognized him. I don't know if he recognized him from the three years ago when he was in the kingdom and Obadiah was there when Elijah went and said, hey, Ahab, guess what? No food or water. It's drought. I don't know if Elijah was marked by God somehow. There's a lot I don't know, but here's what I do know. Obadiah went, whoa, you're Elijah. I finally recognize you. And he bowed down to the ground. And he said, is it really you, my Lord? Now, I want to make sure we point this out. <clears throat> this my Lord, he's not saying Elijah is God. What Elijah is doing, is he, or Obadiah is doing, he's giving respect to Elijah. Really, if you want to, a different way of saying this is sir or mister. It's an opportunity to show respect. So Obadiah is not worshiping Elijah. He's giving him the respect he's due. He's the man of God. And as a man of God, as Obadiah is a servant of God, he meets the man of God. He goes, whoa, hey, sir, how are you doing today? Boy, everybody's been looking for you. Where have you been hiding? I just wonder what that conversation looked like. What have you been up to for the last three years? So he says, uh, yes, he replied, go tell your master. Who's the master? Ahab. I, Obadiah, it's me, Elijah. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn around. I want you to go find Ahab, and I want you to tell him, guess who I found? You'll never guess in a thousand years who I've seen. You ever have that game, play that game? I'll give you five guesses who I've seen. It just happened to me driving down. I passed someone on 95, and I'm like, man, that looks like that person. Like, oh, I haven't seen them in a couple years. I wonder how they're doing. So I'm going to go home to my family. I'm going to say, guess what? You'll never guess who I see. And they get five guesses. And they start down and they try to narrow it down and to see who they find, who I found. Eli Elijah says to Obadiah, go back to Ahab and say, hey, guess what? You'll never guess who I found. Because Elijah is the one prophet they've been seeking to try to kill. So Obadiah, he returns and he says, absolutely, I have no problem doing that. Right? <laughs> Obadiah goes, man, what did I do to you? Why do I have to die? It's, almost, it's to try to break the tension a little bit. It's almost like you, you drew the short stick to go tell the boss that people are upset. Why do I have to go? What did I do? Obadiah noticed his first response, fear. I've been undercover for three years, at least three years, stashing these prophets, and I've been able to just fly underneath the radar. You want me to step out, and you want me to go tell the king, who is so 
angry with you. And his wife is even angrier that I found you. What did I do to you? Why? What have I done that you're handing your servant over to Ahab to be put to death? He's going to kill me. If he finds out that you're here and I knew about it, I am dead. So let me ask you this. I've, I've wrestled with this for three weeks. Is Obadiah living in fear? I don't know either. Thanks for a response. I'll, I'll go with I don't know. Part of me says he's living in fear. And part of me says look at the, look at the pedigree and the history of Obadiah. What's he been doing? He's been hiding the prophets. He's been providing water. He's been providing food. He's kept his faith since a young boy in God. We'll get to that in a minute. But yet Obadiah is sitting there going, oh, I don't know. This is a tall task. This is a tough pill to swallow. So Elijah says, as surely as the Lord your God lives, there is not a nation or kingdom where my master has not someone to look for you. Obadiah looks at Elijah and says, hey, bud, listen, they've turned over every single rock trying to find you. I mean, this is like America's most wanted. His picture is in every single post office. No rock has been left unturned. Elijah, your head is wanted off of your shoulders by the king. And he has spared no expense. And whenever we go to a nation or kingdom and claim that you're not there, look at what the Ahab says. He made them swear they could not find you. Upon death, you better swear you're not hiding this prophet. And where's Elijah been the last two and a half years? In Jezebel's hometown. Now, did they not go there? Did God conceal him? I don't know, friends. I, have, I am perfectly fine standing here saying, I don't know. God did it, and that settles it, and it's good enough for me. But Obadiah is sitting there going, you want me to step up to the king and go, hey, I was out roaming. Guess who I found? Elijah. The king's going to be so mad because they've sworn by every single nation, you've got to swear you don't have this guy. So Obadiah looks at him and says, now tell me to, now t but now you tell me to go to my master and say Elijah's here. You want me to take that next step of faith? Elijah's looking at Obadiah saying, you've got to walk in obedience. And I just wonder how long it took Ob uh, Elijah to go from Zarephath to Samaria. And going, okay, God, I'm trusting in you. Okay, God, I'm trusting in you. I'm trusting in you. Remember, God's been depositing these tokens of faith through the raven, through the brook, through the widow, through the resurrection of the widow's son, now he's saying to Elijah, take the next step. So Elijah's challenging Obadiah, saying, hey, listen, go tell your master, take the next step of faith. Elijah is here. He says, I don't know where the Spirit of the Lord may carry you. Obadiah says, hold on. Hold on, bud. Wait a second. I don't know if you're going to be here. Because you have this reputation of being here one minute and then you're gone the next. I don't want to step out, put my head on the line, literally my neck on the line, and then me say to him, hey, Ahab, Elijah's uh, the fourth rock down on the right-hand side on the second mountaintop. And then him go there, and you're gone, and then I'm sitting there holding the bag. Is Obadiah struggling with faith? I would say no. I, I would say no. And if you want to say yes, that'd be a fun discussion. You say no, and I'll say yes, and it'd be a fun discussion. But Obadiah is saying, listen, this is a huge step of faith because God's spirit may carry you away when I leave you. You may be here, but then you're going to be gone. What kind of guarantees do I have that you're going to be here and you're going to stay here? Because Obadiah is coming out. Going back to the undercover boss, Obadiah is going to come out and say, I am the boss. The big reveal is coming. And Obadiah wants to make sure that Elijah is going to stay there. So he says, if I go and tell Ahab and he doesn't find you, he will kill me. This is the biggest step of faith that Obadiah has ever had to take. And when he takes that step, 
He wants to make sure that there's something there to step on. Make it applicable? Right now, I just watched the news this morning. There was another rescue of five people that fell through the ice. Because they went out on the ice and they stepped on it and poof, it let go. When I go out on the ice, friends, I'm telling you what, I put a truck out there before I go out there. And I'm, sitting, I'm from Pennsylvania and we don't get on the ice for 30 years I got beaten into me. Don't step on the ice. So you sit there and you walk on the ice and you put a little weight on it and you take it off. Okay, that's good. Take another step. Okay, it's good. And Obadiah is sitting there going, you want me to go out there? That's a huge step of faith. What guarantees do I have? It says, I don't know. But look at what it says here. Yet I, your servant, have worshipped the Lord since my youth. Obadiah is not having a crisis of faith. Obadiah is having a wrestling with his faith, saying, I've been all in with God since I was a young boy. So this isn't a, I don't believe. This is a, this is a huge step of faith. I want to make sure somebody's there when I go and tell the king. And it happens in every single one of our lives, too. What if? This is, we could have called it, I could have called this what if. Because Obadiah is looking at Elijah saying, I hear you, but what if I don't? What if you're not here when I leave? And you could say, I'm ready to take this big step of faith, but what if? What if? So it says here in verse 13, haven't you heard? Obadiah looks at Elijah and says, okay, okay, bud, maybe you haven't checked your Facebook feed lately, but there's this thing been going on for the last three years. Maybe you haven't heard, my Lord, or servant, or sir. Maybe you haven't heard, sir, what I did while Jezebel was killing the prophets of the Lord. So now Obadiah is looking at Elijah saying, hey, listen, it's not that I don't have courage. It's not that I don't have faith. I've been trusting in God since I've been a young boy. And it's not that I don't believe. Maybe, hold on, time out. Elijah, maybe you haven't heard what I've been doing. I have been willing to serve the Lord. I've been willing to work for him. I hid the hundred prophets. He's looking at Elijah saying, I've hid a hundred prophets. Okay, put that in there. Come back in a couple weeks. Put that in your bank. There's a hundred prophets other than Elijah that are working for God. Now, did Elijah know that? I don't know, but he does now. Obadiah looked at him and said, hey, bud, listen. There's a hundred prophets. I did it. I hit them. I provided them in two caves, 50 in each. I supplied them with food and water during a drought. So don't tell me, Obadiah says to Elijah, that I am struggling or lacking faith. I just want to make sure when I take that step that there's people there that have my back. So Obadiah is almost presenting this case of faith. I'm willing to take the step if you're willing to step with me. Now, I would say Obadiah is a pretty smart guy. That's just my opinion. Almost like our missionaries do when they go overseas, especially the closed countries. And all they have to do to get in and to have a visa or a work permit to be able to share the gospel, and they very carefully share the gospel so their cover's not blown. So Obadiah says, Elijah, listen, I just got to make sure you're going to be here. It's not that I don't believe. It's not that I don't want to take that next step. It's just that when I take that step, but you better be here. You better be here. And he says, and now you tell me to go to my master and say, Elijah is here. If you're not here, my life is over. It's my career. It's my life. It's my livelihood. And if you're gone, I'm dead. So Elijah says to him, look at what Elijah says. This is a great story. This is a great narrative. Elijah looks at him. He says, God is my witness. It's no different than you or I when we go into court and we put our hand on the Bible and say, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? You're pledging and giving your word that God is your witness and, and God sees all, right, friends? God knows all, right? So Elijah's sitting here going, as the Lord Almighty lives, 
So Elijah is not sort of kind of saying, hey, you know, if the wind blows this way, I'll kind of sort of be here. And if not, well, I'll see you in heaven. Elijah looks at him and says, hey, listen, God is my witness. It's almost back like uh, when Charles Ingalls, if you follow Little House, when Charles Ingalls bought the farm, you remember how he bought the farm? He bought the farm in a handshake because his word was good enough. And yet, friends, now we live in a society where our word is not good enough. So Elijah says to Obadiah, hey, listen, God is my witness. He's invoking the name of God. God as God lives. And you can almost see Obadiah going, whoa, okay, so you're telling me you're serious. God is my witness. I will surely be present to present myself to Ahab today. Today will be the day that Ahab will finally see me. How long has it been? Give or take three years. The most wanted man is turning himself into the king. And guess who's going to turn him in? Obadiah. But guess who told him to turn him in? Elijah. Because it's time. It's time for revival to hit Israel. So my third and final question is not a question, it's a statement. Follow through on your promises. Keep your word. Back when I was a young guy, and you can remember when we used to make promises, but if it was on a Wednesday, you didn't have to keep it. Or does anybody ever tell you, oh, I promise you, but my fingers are crossed and that didn't mean anything? You remember remember that? Listen, the Bible's pretty clear. Let your yes be yes and let your no be no. If you're going to tell someone I'll be there, then be there within reason. If you're going to tell someone, I've got your back, then guess what? You stick with them. Because Elijah's looking at Obadiah saying, hey, listen, bud, it's time. It's time, it's time, it's time. And I give you my word. God is my witness. I will be here. Are you keeping your word? Are you keeping your promises to people? Or are you one of those people that makes something and you go, oh, well, it's complicated. You know what that is? That's an excuse. And so I just want to sit here for a minute and really challenge you. If you promise somebody something, let your word be something. Let your word mean something. If you're going to back someone, back them. If you're not, then not but let your yes be yes and let your no be no. Let your yes be yes and let your no be no. The three questions this morning, the first one, are you bending the culture to an ungodly culture? Do you feel yourself starting to break? Or you want to be like Obadiah and work underneath the scenes and behind the scenes? Who can you encourage as uh, someone is serving? And then the final one is not a question, it's a statement, it's a declarative. Follow through on your promises. Keep your word. Next week, I love our message. I called it a roast, a rain, and a run. Come on. I worked all week on that. That's all I got. Lord, we're so thankful for your word. We're thankful for the life of Obadiah. We're thankful for the life of Elijah, the man of God who was yet again told to leave his comfort of Zarephath to go into the fire. And yet we see in our challenge to be able to walk in obedience to you. Lord, help us to be like Obadiah. As we live and as we serve underneath a government or people that are godless, may we not bend towards culture, but may we be in this world but not be of this world. Lord, as we go throughout our week, may we find someone to encourage. Maybe it is someone who needs bread and water. Maybe it's someone that needs a word of encouragement. Maybe it's someone that needs a phone call. Maybe it's someone that needs a text. Maybe it's someone that needs a cup of coffee. Lord, I don't know, but help us, each one of us, to encourage someone as they're serving. And Lord, as the world looks at each one of us and says, hey, you're a Christian. May they look at us and say, if they said it, that settles it. Because they're men and women that keep their word. 
So, Lord, I pray that you would challenge us, that you would encourage us, and that you would continue to help us to become the men and women, boys and girls that you have called us to be as we walk in obedience. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.